All right. Um, welcome, everyone. I am. Uh, so this will be my first live stream using a new platform um, on Restream. So this will be hopefully reaching you on, on YouTube, LinkedIn, um, even on Twitch. Close myself there. I wanted to make sure the YouTube started. Um, so if there's any any issues with the stream, please let me know. Uh, chat should be open in all of those platforms. And I believe the, the, the Restream platform here will bring those all into me. Um, definitely say hi if you're um, new, and uh, and I got to figure out how to look at analytics because I'm not sure if I'm if I'm in a room all by myself right now. Um, so yes, please use chat if you have any comments. Uh, I should see those, and I will definitely take time to answer questions. If uh, again, if for some reason message isn't getting through um, LinkedIn or, or Twitter, please feel free to, to reach out at another venue for me. Um, before we get started here, uh, I guess welcome to the session, first of all. Uh, with this session, we're going to be looking at analyzing malicious office documents. This is really geared towards more of a beginner. I'll, I'll probably blend in a few intermediate topics or, or techniques. Um, so if you've been analyzing maldocs for years and years, you, you know you, you may learn something. I know I always learn something when I listen to somebody else, even if I've been doing that task for some time. Um, but it's really geared towards those of you that are, are new in your career and maybe Maldocs are something that you've heard of and you, you haven't analyzed yet or don't have a lot of experience. Um, they are very prevalent. Uh, you will certainly encounter them in the field, especially if you're working in a security center, a SOC or something, as they're one of the primary ways in which um, organizations and, and the, the users of that organization are going to be attacked. Um, so that's why we're going to focus on those. Um, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop those. Uh, I'll keep an eye on and uh, the chat here, and then I'll answer those as we go. Um, to get started, then, I'm going to move over to a screen share. Hopefully you can see um, both myself and, and my browser now. Um, I want to first give a big shout out, a big thank you to Jerry Osier, Dr. Osier uh, of Simply Cyber. He uh, hooked me up with an intro video and the uh, the nice overlay that you see um, above and below. And so he's been a, a great help and he is also very passionate about cyber, particularly helping folks to get started on that career path and that journey. So if you haven't had a chance to check out Jerry's content, um, please do so. You can find his information on simplycyber.io and you can um, definitely uh, his YouTube channel. He does a lot of streaming as you can see here on this website. So thanks, Jerry. If you're here, uh, it's it's great to see you. Now, um, next thing we'll take a look at is the environment. And so I'm not necessarily going to get into a lot of detail here on the environment. That's probably a really good topic for another time. But I do want to make uh, at least point out the different platforms that I'll be using today. Um, first will be uh, Remnix. Uh, most malware analysts are familiar with Remnix. It's a distribution, a Linux distribution that has uh, many, many, many of the tools that you'll need already installed and configured. So it just makes getting up and running a lot easier because then you don't have to, to take the time to install and configure the tool on your own. So Remnix is a great distribution for that. Um, it's maintained and developed by Lenny Zeltzer, who is, is also a longtime SANS instructor. So I'll be using that today. Um, it's, it's a good idea to, if you're you know new to getting into malware analysis and you don't have a lab environment, that's definitely something that should be on the top of your list. And so getting a, a dedicated, dedicated systems, virtual machines, the hosts, even the network set up, um, to help protect protect yourself, protect the assets that maybe are sharing that same network. Um, and, and again, that's really a conversation for another day. But I just wanted to, to kind of plant that seed. Uh, if you're not, if you're thinking about malware, you don't have a lab environment. Definitely something that you want to look into. And maybe that'll be the topic of a, of a future live session. Um, the other VM that we'll use is the Flare VM. And let's see, I've got a nice little graphic here. Um, with the Flare VM, this is something that is maintained by Mandiant. You can find it on GitHub. Uh, the challenge with the, with the Flare VM, or at least something different than with Remnix, with Remnix, it's a Linux distro. All the tools are there. It's all open source stuff. So it's really easy to just bundle everything together. With the Flare VM, it's designed to run on top of Windows. So it, they, they, don't, they can't ship you your own Windows VM because of, I believe, licensing issues. So you have to find and field your own Windows VM. Um, Lenny Zeltzer on his blog, he has some really great advice on how to get Windows VMs to help set up your analysis environment. So I don't have those links handy, but um, I'll make sure to, to look those up and maybe post it in the comments after the, the session's done. 
Um, so once you get your own uh, Windows VM set up, then you can go to the instructions here on the README and go ahead and run through the installation script. And then this will turn your, 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 you know, your vanilla Windows VM into a malware analysis system, install a bunch of tools. It'll even make some nice configuration changes like disabling Defender, changing a bit of the layout, and, and just, again, making it easier to use for malware analysis. So those are the two systems that we're going to use. Um, there you could see the link for Flare VM. Uh, Remnix is just remnix.org, so R-E-M-N-U-X.org. Um, before I forget, I did want to point out, I do have a number of malware analysis exercises. Uh, you look probably similar to malware traffic analysis that is maintained by Brad Duncan, very much inspired by him. Uh, I just, well, he takes a very network traffic central focus. Uh, I'm trying to make it a little bit more about the, the malware artifacts. So you'll see on this GitHub, I have a number of exercises that you can check out. Hopefully, if I don't forget, we'll come back and, and look at one here at the end of the session. And then diff different samples that I've come across over the last couple of years that I think are interesting. I also have artifacts or the sample files that I've, that I've hosted for different workshops over the years. Um, so probably from this session, I'll go ahead and I'll make an entry here in, in 2022 and, and post all those samples that I use. That way, if you're, you know, probably won't help you so much right now as you're follow if you're following along, but certainly if you're watching this after the session, you'll be able to grab those artifacts and follow along. So just wanted to point that out. Simply Cyber has found out. Oh, great. Yeah, it's just a, a comment from... Jenny, that's that's great to hear. Um, uh, Jerry, I've, I've known Jerry for a couple of years now. We were in the same uh, doctoral program together, and uh, that's how we got to know each other. So uh, he's just been a great, a great friend and a colleague. Okay, so I think we're ready to just jump into the analysis. So what we'll do now, I will. I'm going to uh, switch my screen share. And grab my VM. There it is. Okay. Um, I've got the, the font size bumped up is about as large as I can make it without starting to get the output of, of different tools and stuff a little too squished. Uh, again, I see the chats coming in. So if anybody has any, um, any <laughs> if, I can, if I can make it zoom in a little bit better or anything, please let me know. Um, so getting started with Office documents, um, a number of ways that you can get started with them. Right? If you're, you know, if you're, you're working for an organization as part of a security team, odds are you're dealing with them on a daily basis. They're, they're hitting an email filter or gateway. They're, you know, showing up in users' inboxes, and, and you have a chance to analyze them then and there. Um, of course, many of you are, are likely, you know, beginning early in your career, and so maybe you're looking for more independent sources to grab those. Uh, there's a number of sandboxes and different platforms that you can use. And in fact, it's become quite prolific that you can find samples. My GitHub is an example. You can go there, read a little blurb about you know, what type of malware is at play, maybe something interesting. Typically, there's an office stock involved. You can grab those samples, download them, analyze them. Malware traffic analysis, same thing. Um, you can go to places like the URL house, which I use uh, almost on a daily basis, um, urlhouse.abuse.ch. They have a ton of great projects. Um, the URL house is just one, and the Malware Bazaar is another. Uh, the URL house is, is more about managing URLs. The Malware Bazaar is a little bit more about the actual malware itself. So, but you can find you can find office stocks on either one of those. Um, there's two main sandboxes that I I tend to gravitate towards. Um, any run is one. Any dot run. You can get a free account and get access to their, their free platform. They've got kind of got a freemium model like a lot of online sandboxes do. Works out really well because you can upload samples. You can get some analysis results. You can download samples as well. Um, you just have to keep in mind that when you upload samples to these platforms, they're free or they're public. Um, they're, they're publicly available. So you have to be a little bit careful if you're actually performing an investigation or investigating a real threat actor in your organization, you might wanna be careful as to what you upload. The other one is by Hatching, group that brought us Cuckoo. Um, and similar, there's a, a freemium model. You can sign up, you can start using it. 
you can look at reports and then you can start to uh, search and download samples. So here's an example from, uh, I believe just earlier today, uh, all of the tags here, um, uh, any run does something very similar and that you can see there's these tags and just help to identify different aspects of a, of a certain analysis. Uh, this one has XLM, that would indicate uh, a type of macro that we'll talk about here before we wrap up today. And you can then, you know, investigate this submission, this analysis, and you can usually download the samples. So right there on the upper left-hand corner, pretty easy to do. The password is almost always infected. So if you didn't know that, or if you've come across, you know, you download some malware from someplace like a GitHub repository, and it's a password protected zip, it's almost always infected. Sometimes folks will change it. Usually they put that information somewhere that's obvious so that you can decrypt that zip and get the content inside. We want them zipped because it's just another way of, well, there's probably two main things in my mind. One, it helps to prevent any sort of, of you know, antivirus malware detection, grabbing that zip before you can download it. So let's say they didn't password protect it from this website here from triage well then the browser would probably would would flag the download as malicious and try to prevent it or block it the other is that then you just get one last reminder that you're about to deal with something malicious be very careful you should probably be in a lab environment yes right david nice to see you um infected is all lowercase at least it typically is um, I've worked with some colleagues in the past that decided to go with non-standard passwords. Uh, again, if you do that, just make it clear to your colleagues that you're using a non-standard password. Um, whenever I share malware in the courses I teach, I always make a non-standard password. And I always communicate that with anyone in my course that, hey, I'm using a non-standard password here. Um, and it's good to take note yourself because I've had several times where I've password protected something for like a workshop, did something non-standard, and then I forgot the password <laughs> and then I can't recover the content. Okay, so these are just some places that you can go explore and grab the documents. For the first document then, um, this is one that has been around for a little bit. Uh, I'll likely, I have a full lab guide and you'll see these lab guides when we circle back around to the GitHub in just a little bit. Uh, I haven't posted this one before, so pro I'll probably do that. Um, if you're interested in, in doing full analysis with a full guide, we're just going to touch on some of the kind of the key points to my methodology. I'll be happy to post that. So if I forget to do that, please, someone just just remind me. Um, I've got a bunch of artifacts here in this in this directory. So let's start with just the file itself. Um, I've renamed it. You know, oftentimes you'll see the files as you download them. They'll be either the original name that they were uploaded to the platform, or maybe there'll be a hash, a, an MD5 or a SHA-256. I just shortened that down so that I could, one, remember the, what, I, what artifact I'm looking at, and two, it doesn't take up so much of my terminal. Um, one of the first things that I typically do is just try to identify the type of artifact that I'm dealing with. Um, you know, if we think about a, a, I don't know, a typical attack scenario, you're going to have an office document attached to an email delivered to a user. The user is going to, at least from the adversary's perspective, oh, they hopefully that they open that up, enable macros. Macros are then going to execute PowerShell or VB script or, or something, oftentimes to reach out to the internet to download next stages. Um, eventually, native code PE files will enter the environment. Those will be the things that will tend to persist. Maybe there'll be a loader, so they'll pull down additional malware. Um, but this, this whole sequence of events kind of occurs. And so depending on the type of artifact that we're dealing with, that can determine where you might be in that whole chain of events and the type of tools that you need, the type of data that you're going to be able to gather, how complex the analysis might be. Just again, in general, I would say as we move from, from left to right, and I think about this in terms of MITRE attack, um, initial delivery to post exploitation. As we move from left to right on that, if we as we move from left to right in an attack scenario, things just tend to get more complicated. The the tools that you need in Ida Pro and Agidra are a little bit more involved than just analyzing macro code. So just something to keep in mind. So using something simple like file, we can see that we do have a composite document file, an Office document, and in this case, it says the creating application is Microsoft Office Word. So my initial thoughts when I see something like that is, well, it's probably going to have VBA style macros, uh, Visual Basic for Application macros. Those are the 
main, the primarily supported macro versions, the one preferred by recent versions of Office for legitimate use. So then they're also abused by uh, you know by adversaries. Um, Remnix has a lot of tools. Uh, these are OLE files. So if you just type in OLE and hit tab twice, you'll see all of the different tools that are available. So you know, part of, of learning malware analysis, part of learning how to analyze Office documents is just getting familiar with tools. What do they do? What, what information do they provide? What artifacts are they relevant to? So we can use OLE um, file and our file is doc.bin. No, oh, I didn't want that. I wanted OLE. There we go. So OLE ID, let me just scroll back a little bit, uh, file is doc.bin. So there's our command. And what this does is it tries to uh, you know, essentially identify and then summarize key information about this particular file. So we can see that it is not encrypted, that it does contain VBA macros, which is highly suspicious, uh, does not contain XLM macros. We'll talk about those in just a little bit. And these are just things that will help with that initial assessment, that initial triage of the file. So we know that it contains macros. There is an OLE tool to help dump macros, but I guess maybe I'm old school. Maybe this is just my style. Um, I tend to use uh, OLE dump in order to perform my analysis. Um, I find oftentimes that the, the tools that I first really learned how to do something, they tend to be my go-tos. My first real uh, debugger was WinDebug. I still tend to use that quite a bit. Um, similar with a disassembler, I still tend to use IDA over Giger just because I spent far more time in IDA. So we can use OLE dump. It's built into, or it's already installed and configured in Remnix. So we just have to type in oledump.py and the name of the file we want to analyze, and that'll dump out uh, what I see, what I consider a, a table of contents. So this gives us a breakdown of what this particular Office document contains. Now, for the most part, we're interested in finding those macros, and Oli Dump makes it fairly intuitive. The um, indexes here that have a, an uppercase M would indicate that there's macro content. Now you'll notice there's a lowercase M, and what that is, what that's defining is that there is a macro stream, but there is no code associated with it. So the uppercase M's are generally what we're the most interested in. Now, why would this lowercase M be here? Well, you can see, well, on all of these, we can see our, our stream names. This document, this has got a, an obfuscated way of creating this stream name, Cowkeeper. Um, this one is Discord. Um, and this was, this. I think this doc's old enough that Discord wasn't real popular when it was being distributed, so no no relation. The The name of the streams is oftentimes a part of the obfuscation. It's, it's dictionary names, it's nonsensical names, maybe it's offensive names, it just all depends. But uh, with this one, Discord is also the name of a form. And so it doesn't, it doesn't call it out. And if there's a way to make OLE dump do that, I'm not 100% sure, I have never figured it out. This one took me a little bit before I connected the dots on it. But the, the F and the O um, I've, I've come to recognize indicate that there's a user form embedded in the app in the, the office document. So that's your, your kind of your typical thick client form. You can have a dialogue, you can have buttons, you can have labels. It, it, it's, a, it's a form, it's an application. And how they're oftentimes used is then you'll have different objects on that form and data will be stored there. But strings, base64 encoded strings, hex encoded binary content, URLs, you name it, they can be stored inside of those user form objects. And that kind of breaks the association from having to put that data inside of the actual macros. So what, what I see oftentimes, this isn't always the case, but oftentimes is that when these objects, when a, when a form's created and there's objects on the form, well, you can have events. Uh, how do you handle a button click event? Well, you have macros, right? So that's how this is created. But because the authors don't need functionality from the form, there's just no content in it. Okay, um, when we want to investigate, uh, you can do dash H for help, but I'm going to just skip that just because I know I'm going to go long. Uh, dash S and then the index number. So let's say we wanted to look at stream 17. This will just provide a dump in essentially this hex content or in, in like a hex editor view. So you can see there is definitely content here. Look at the right hand side. That's our ASCII view. It kind of sort of looks like base 64. It's not, um, but it is a part of this content 
that is stored inside of some object inside of this user form. I don't usually use this to try to dig too much deeper uh, because it's just harder. There's, I think, better ways to do that. Okay, if we go back to our index, let's say we want to just get back to analyzing the macros. So we've got stream eight and stream 10. So tack S8 and dash V. So that tells OLE dump to decompress those. And then I'm going to just redirect those to a file. I just usually do something simple like S8, S10. Use the stream name. Sometimes that can be helpful, but we'll call this good for now. And then I'm going to use Visual Studio Code to open those streams up. So had we not redirected that content to a, a file, it would have just printed right there to standard out, which depending on the macros and what your objectives are, you know, it, it might not be such a bad thing. Um, keep in mind, as we're going through this, um, there are oftentimes quicker ways. So if you're looking at an office doc, you get a macro, you just want to see what it's doing. The, the quickest thing might be to throw it in a sandbox, put it in any run, put it in triage. Maybe you've got a, a local appliance or something that can be the quickest way. You can just throw it in there, watch its behavior, see if it connects out to the internet. That might be all you need. Uh, for educational purposes, though, I, I tend to go the more difficult route. Let's really get in here and, and try to analyze these in more detail. So something that I always keep in the back of my head is, you know, is there a quicker way? What are my analysis objectives? What are my goals? What am I planning to get out of the work I'm putting into it? And what's the best, most time efficient way to do that? So again, this isn't always, you don't always need to dump macro code. You don't always need to get in here and analyze these because you might be able to get the same, the same information in, in a quicker method. Um, but we are investigating the macros. Um, what we're looking for now is the entry point, or, or typically what we look for is the entry point. Now, auto results in that stream. And just do Oh, where am I overlooking it here? Nope, oh, typo. Maybe not open, maybe it's an open keyword. There it is. So the auto functions, auto open, auto close, um, document open, document close. There's a number that malware authors and, and legitimate macro code writers can tie into in order to make sure that when the macros are enabled, their code executes. Uh, so when we look at, let's see if I have an example of one here. You know, when a user opens this document, if they get the little banner or the little ribbon across the top that says, hey, this has macro code enable content in order to enable that content. That's oftentimes what the, the social engineering inside of the document is attempting to do is to get them to enable that content to execute the macro. So when that content's enabled, oftentimes, you know, there's a document open, auto open, that method will start the whole chain of bad events. Sometimes it's on close. So it waits until you close the document because then the thought is if it's waiting till it's on close, the environment, say it's a sandbox, that's already tearing down and maybe it'll miss analysis and, and look like it's more benign. Um, cool random tip. We got, uh, you can pipe directly to your clipboard with clip. I don't think I've ever tried that. So if we wanted to this. Not found. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, but that would be pretty cool. That'd be another way to get things into memory. And there's certainly going to be some commands that we're going to look at here in just a little bit that will um, that will take advantage or could take advantage of that. Okay, so here we have document open. This is our entry point. This is going to be the code that begins to uh, to execute once this the macros are enabled. Uh, again, sandboxes, typically they are configured to just enable that content right away. It makes sense, right? We want to automate the analysis. We don't want to have to manually log into each one and enable content. Now, this exhibits, in my opinion, some, some pretty standard obfuscation. We have this function, begins here at line 146 now, it ends here at 162. What is all of this stuff? Do we need to care about all of it? And again, it depends a little bit on how detailed we want our analysis to give. 
Um, oftentimes, though, I just want to skip along. I'm just trying to, to pick out key points in the, the macro code to, to hone in on it. And this example, it um, let's just take a look at it. So here is this document that was uploaded. This was in 2020. So again, a little, little old. Um, but you can you can observe some of the behaviors, such as word launching explorer.exe. So that's different than what we see a lot of today. A lot of today we see PowerShell or run DLL32 or Red Server 32. And either a DLL or an executable that's downloaded, PowerShell, you'll see a lot of base64 encoded content. So the PowerShell command being invoked directly with a base64 string. PowerShell will decode that and execute that. I have an example of that here as well. So this one launches explorer.exe. And if we look at the, the information about that process, uh, my screen's getting a little bit jumbled here, but hopefully you can see okay. Uh, we can see that it is actually launching C Windows Explorer.exe. So when I see something like that, uh, a, 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 you know, an executable, a, a system executable loaded from its legitimate path, then I start to think of process hollowing. So taking that executable, loading it into memory, but suspending it before execution begins, replacing code with bad code, and then resuming execution, and now the bad stuff can happen. And, and that's actually what's happening here. So you know, if, if this were a PowerShell, then what I'd be looking for in these macros is more evidence of where is that PowerShell going to be executed. In this case, it's doing process hollowing. So how does it do that? And that's what I'm looking for evidence of. So with that in mind, we start to tackle the obfuscation, the, the you know, the intents, the actions taken by the malware authors or their kits to just make these harder to, 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 to reverse engineer, harder to investigate. Um, if you look at, let's say, the strings, right? Strings are always a pretty important artifact to find. Um, what is the, uh, just got a question here. What is the URL of the website that shows all these information? So let's go to, you can go to uh, app.anyrun or triage. Those are two. I'm not sure where my response just went. <laughs> it looks like it went to YouTube for sure. I'm not so sure about LinkedIn though. Uh, but app.anyrun or triage, those are the two sites that I'm looking at right now. App.anyrun, that's just that just takes you to the results page. If you go to, to any.run, you'll just get their main landing page and then you can navigate to the same location from there. Uh, and then triage, T-R-I-A dot G-E. And you'll find all of this, all of this analysis. If you're looking for a specific a sample here, then I can share that with you as well. Okay, perfect. Okay, so the the strings here, you know, strings are important. No matter what type of artifact you're looking at, investigating, strings are important. They they typically represent valuable information. Objects are going to be created, IPs, domains, file system paths, registry keys, you name it. So when you find strings, that that's one of the first things that you oftentimes want to identify and then figure out how to unravel. Now, this is pretty standard in that you're taking a string and it's being broken apart and concatenated. So we have this U case, BO, and then ampersand, and then left. So it's concatenating those two values. It's also doing a little bit of manipulation. So on this right-hand side of this concatenation, we have the left keyword and we're getting two characters. So we're getting the left two characters of that string. So it's a much bigger string that they're only taking a bit, a bit of, in this case, just two characters from. Also very common because then it's a little bit harder to, you know, to automatically extract maybe a, a more significant string value. Uh, this then becomes B-O-O-F. Um, I don't know what that is. That's not a significant string, at least not in anything I've come across. So it could be that this is just a junk instruction. What I oftentimes do just to, you know, kind of get that, that 60,000 foot view, we have this variable booklet. So this instruction here is assigned to this variable booklet. I double click that. And if, and if I, and since I highlighted that in code, if booklet was used anywhere else, it would also highlight, well, let's see like, right. You can see I highlighted, right. It's highlighted now to other locations. It's never used in the contents of this function. So to me, that's a pretty good indication that that's garbage. 
And as you continue to look at these, this variable here is assigned a, a constant value of 58. It is used in this if statement, but then we look inside this if statement and we see, again, a little bit of string concatenation, a little bit of arithmetic, but it doesn't do anything. So likely all of that is just garbage. If you are really trying to pull apart some macros, then you could start to delete that. You could look for these patterns and say, oh, okay, so all of this is junk, then I'm just gonna get rid of it. That way it will help make my analysis, I'll be able to be a bit more focused. Um, oftentimes though, you, know, you just get to recognize that and then you don't have to worry about it. So that only really leaves this, this manslaughter. <laughs> Again, kind of strange selection of names, but it's pretty common to have random dictionary words, offensive things. So this is actually a function call. And if we just do a search for it, we'll find a little bit higher in this macro stream, our call to manslaughter. Okay, now we're starting to see a little bit more code. And you'll see examples like discord.playbill. I don't know how to pronounce that. I'll just call it penial.control tip text. So that's the name of that form, remember? Control tip text sounds like a property of some sort of a, of a form object. Maybe it's a button, maybe it's a label, maybe it's, I don't know. But that sounds like uh, it's part of it, and it is. So when you see, you can connect the dots on that being a user form and you know, properties of objects on that form, that's actually where this content is coming from. So there's a really good chance that this variable, especially because it's being used a little bit later on, is something valuable. Now, do we wanna to continue to analyze? We could, right? We could continue to, um, to trace through this code in order to figure out what's going on. We could start by pulling off, pulling these, these strings, trying to deobfuscate them. Um, now, keep in mind, the way that my workflow always goes is, I know this is going to launch a process. It looks like from the sandbox that we just analyzed, let's go back to that, that it's going to launch explore.exe. So there's going to be the initial kind of entry point of where all the code begins. And then oftentimes at the very end is when that next stage will execute. And everything in between oftentimes is there to just deobfuscate code. It's to get the next stage ready. So I don't really care unless I want to understand how it's how it's how things are obfuscated, right? We saw all that content inside that what I said looks like a user form object. Right? If I maybe I want to really understand how to deobfuscate that, then I could write some Python and I could automatically extract it and and decode it and then extract important IOCs or whatever happens to be in there. I could do that, but. I really just want to get to the point where that next critical stage takes place. That is, this somehow gets to be loading, excuse me, loading that, that, that explorer.exe process and likely injecting shellcode into it. So I'm trying not to get lost in all the weeds here because I, I certainly could. You could continue to methodically th you know, go through all of this in a, in, a, in a linear fashion, but it could take a lot of time. Um, if we look at this other stream, uh, stream 10, also called cowkeeper, right? And you'll oftentimes see the name of the, of the module, the macros at the top of these. What you'll see here is, is very interesting. The first time I came across this, and thanks, Jerry. <laughs> um, the, it's the use of the Windows API. So if you're not familiar with the Windows API, it's something that as a, as a malware analyst, you will definitely become very, uh, you'll become very, very interested and you'll, you'll need to learn it to, you know, the, the 32nd is that it is the, the, the API, the application programming interface. It's the, the way in which programs interact with the operating system. So you need to allocate memory, you, act, you interact through the Windows API. You need to create a process when, through the Windows API. You need to open a network connection, right? <laughs> Get the picture. Everything goes through the Windows API. So we have sort of this normal, we can do things in VBA code, or we can actually link directly to the Windows API. So when it comes to techniques like process hollowing, again, there's some really good resources out there. I think I've even got a, a blog on it. I, I don't remember offhand. It's, it's just a, it's a process of, of a, a sequence of APIs that are called in order to load a process, replace the memory, write new memory, resume the process. And there's six or eight different specific APIs that do that. So we observe, well, it's using the Windows API, right? 
And we have things like virtual alloc EX and RTL move memory. And these are both ways. This will allocate memory. EX is a different version of virtual alloc. Virtual alloc allocates memory. Virtual alloc EX allows you to allocate memory in another process. All right, so Word, starting Explorer, allocating memory in Explorer. Starting to make sense. Uh, RTL move memory. Let's take our shell code from our office doc. Let's copy it into this newly launched process that we're allocating new memory in so that we can execute that shell code. So we might want to look for evidence of these type of Windows APIs, and that might help us. Let's say that we, call, we will look for betterment. Okay, here we have this, 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 essentially this alias that's defined here that represents virtual alloc EX. So if we look for betterment, uh, there it is. Right. We can now maybe skip a little bit closer to where that, that critical phase is about to occur. Um, for the sake of time, I am going to show you. Um, let me see here. Where are the real actions taking place? So, you know, first time I look at this, it's uh, oftentimes it's a little bit of trial and error. If it's not immediately clear exactly how everything's working, it may be a little bit of trial and error. Um, we're going to jump over to the Windows VM in just a second, and I'll show you how to use the Office Suite, the Office Debugger, because that can be a way to. Right now, we're doing everything statically. We're not we're not executing any code. We're just investigating it statically, manually. But we can oftentimes use dynamic analysis setting breakpoints and watching the execution of things in order to, to speed up our analysis process. Uh, Justin just asked, is this a captured malware? Um, yeah, so this was an office stock that was used a couple of years ago to deliver. I think it was Hansitter. So it got captured by somebody. It got uploaded to a, a, to a, a platform such as Triage or AnyRun because likely somebody at, a, at, a, at an organization encountered it. They were investigating it. They uploaded it to share it. Uh, it could have got caught by a spam trap, and then somebody wrote up an entry about it and posted it. I don't remember exactly where I got this particular document, but a, a similar process. Um, and so now that we've got our hands on it, because you know, eventually, if 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 threat actors are going to use these, they're going to distribute them either broadly or very narrowly, but they're going to distribute them, and then they can be shared with the research community. Um, so. So it, it can be some trial and error. Uh, and eventually, I came to the point where I recognized this to be that, that, critical, that critical piece, that critical next stage. Now, what does Cabriolet do? Well, if we looked at this list of, of APIs, here's Cabriolet. I think that's how you pronounce it. And they, it is a call to enum date formats W. So, okay, we're, we're kind of on this, this path of it's allocating memory, it's moving things into memory, it's likely then going to execute that content in memory. If not, then it's got to launch the process somewhere in the macro code, but you know, there's really no evidence of that. How does it execute what's in memory? And enum date formats W does not seem like a very likely candidate. But when you look up... So let's just look up uh, the MSDN. So the, the Microsoft Developers Network. Let's see if this will be. No, that's the enum. Uh, an, an, an enum is an enumeration. That's a way to share memory for a structure or an object. Um, there we go. But only take up four bytes. So it could be like a four byte structure, but it's an enum, so it could be four different data types. Uh, what did I just click on? Okay, here we go. So this is what I wanted to get to. And what you'll see on MSDN, it's going to provide you most times a definition of an API, of a function that you want to investigate. Now, Microsoft uses its own sort of way of defining a function. Uh, you have oftentimes um, your variable types are going to be more word, D word, quad word, uh, byte rather than string or integer. And, and that's just a convention that Microsoft uses. 
In this case, though, what we're really focused on is what does this really do? And you can, you can see in the syntax definition here, it expects three arguments, a pointer to a date format enum procedure. And if you just look a little bit further, they'll oftentimes define the parameters. And what this is, is a pointer to an application defined callback function. So it's a pointer to a function. So by calling enum date formats and providing as that first argument, a pointer to a place in memory, Microsoft Windows will go and execute what's ever there. It'll treat it like a function. So let's go back to our macro code. There is our call, three arguments. So that lines up, APRUM. And if we highlight that, what we can do now is we can trace that variable backwards a little bit. So here it is assigned Bayberry plus Anklet. And if we scroll back a little bit further, you can see Bayberry equals foam and a argument of meeting house. Okay, not so sure about that, but what we can do is we can just look for where foam is defined. And it's defined just up above. And guess what? There's our call to betterment. Betterment is virtual alloc. What does virtual alloc return? Well, if we didn't know, we could go to MSDN and, and figure it out. But virtual alloc will return the a pointer to the address in memory that was just allocated. So we don't necessarily need to get lost in all of the details here. We certainly could. But if we go back here, okay, we know that Bayberry is the a pointer to that new memory allocation. And then Bayberry is added to Anklet. And Anklet's defined either here or here. And this happens to be in this if else. So if it's 64 bit, add these values. Else, if it's 32 bit, add these values. So this is actually kind of cool. And I didn't notice this the first 10 times I looked at this document. What it, this is deciding is this, this shell code that we're now getting ready to execute in memory, it's, it's, it's got 64 bit and 32 bit code. So depending on the platform that it's on, it will determine the offset to jump into that shell code and either execute 64 bit or 32 bit. So anklet is just the sum of these variables. This variable here is just, okay, so it's just the sum of those three, two different offsets. So kind of a neat thing. Uh, and that's where anklet comes. So anklet gets added to this Bayberry, signed to Aprum, Aprum's our, our argument. So this is a significant thing because this is now where that next stage of this shell code is, or well, the next stage of our macros are going to execute. So again, did I jump right here the first time I analyzed this? I, I certainly didn't. It took me some time of wrestling through some of this obfuscation, starting to filter out that which is noise, tracing some of the different um, you know, Windows API functions as we were exploring until I eventually got to this point and it all, and it all made sense. Now, any questions so far? Seeing a lot of QBot with Office Docs. Yeah, I, I think that's a true statement. Um, so uh, the comment from Sean was uh, seeing a lot of QBot with Office Office Docs. You can go to the URL house. Uh, here's some QBot. Uh, DLLs, these are all DLLs. So this was something I was looking at earlier. But you can just go to their browse. They have the ability to do some, some real you know, basic filtering here. Uh, on the domain, on the IP, on on some of the file types, we could we could try like file type XLS. Didn't get a whole lot. File type doc, probably a little bit more. Um, and and this can be a way if again if you're not consuming threat feeds somewhere, this can be a really good way to go and just see what's being submitted to the URL house. It's it's largely driven by independent researchers and a community. Of course, there are organizations that are contributing as well. It has a full API, very capable, very powerful. So you can you can automate it, you can script it, you can get probably more you know, better access to the actual data that's behind the URL house. And then I think one of the greatest things about them is this tagging. 
So uh, the URL house does a great job. I believe it is really just one person, some random Swiss guy. If you look at the site, uh, the tagging can really help. So usually if I get a doc, look at that, get the hash, look at it on the URL house, or if I extract an IP, which we'll do in a minute, go to the URL house. This can help identify at least what type of malware you're dealing with. Uh, Jerry, question about the, can I do this? Oh, cool. Okay. Um, do you have any tools or automation to clean up the nonsense variable threat actors? Uh, no, I don't. I don't have any good tools. I think there's some out there. Um, some of the OLE tools has a, has a decode option. Um, I think Viper Monkey is another tool that, that tries to do some deobfuscation, but it's hit and miss on how well they actually work. Um, I've had the most luck if I'm really interested in automating the deobfuscation of all the stuff we're looking at, just writing some custom Python. And what I'll show you before we wrap up here is an exercise that'll just, I'm not, I, I didn't plan on covering any of that today, but I have an exercise that'll walk you through just a basic, a basic example of not necessarily clearing up the obfuscation, but picking out the important pieces from the office stock, and, you know, deobfuscating that and then extracting. Oftentimes it's going to be just the next stage that the HTTP URLs to download the next stage. Yeah, yeah, great, great point by David. Um, it's just really hard. It's really hard to clean this up and to do it in a way that's that's fully automated. I've just never come across something that works really well, really, really consistently. It's so it, it is absolutely challenging. Um, and, and and you know, as you see here, it's not it's not as though we're dealing with something that is. I mean, we can look at it as a human being and say, well, this isn't hard. I mean, we can pick out the patterns pretty quickly, especially after you've looked at enough documents. But minor changes in how they are obfuscated breaks your tooling. And now you have to dig in and figure out what broke and how to update your scripts to automate the deobfuscation. And if that happens every few days, then it's just this never ending back and forth that can get pretty, uh, pretty, pretty frustrating. Yeah, right. So another great, another great comment. Um, you know, as you get into more of the the automation of of unpacking and deobfuscating, there is oftentimes really key functions. Um, eval is is one. Although I don't know if there's an eval equivalent in macros. I just don't remember off the top of my head. I don't run into eval if there is all that often. Um, where you can maybe just hook certain functions and and just dump the content. So run the code and, and dump the content. Um, and that does happen to help in a lot of situations. Um, I think there's some projects that will actually use a debugger like WinDebug and, and try to dump content out of memory from, from certain key, key function calls or object creation. Um, I just haven't worked with them. So I, I can't necessarily recommend uh, something off the top of my head. I think the exercise with the automation and, and Python is probably my, my go-to. Um, and then that doesn't really, well, you'll see an example here. I better keep moving. Otherwise I'm going to talk for three, <laughs> three hours. Um, but you'll see an example and maybe get a better idea what I'm talking about in, in just a minute. Um, okay. So we kind of, we kind of made sense of this, uh, this document and now Let's take a look at, so I'm going to switch to the Windows VM. So this is my Flare VM. You know, if we were to continue to try to analyze that code, if we, if we did it all statically, you know, pretty sure the, the code, the next stage is in that form. We've got all the logic. I mean, that's, that's the thing about analyzing malware is we have the answer. It's right there in front of us, but it can be really difficult to, um, it can be really still difficult to unravel what's going on. So uh, one thing that I oftentimes use is the Office Suite, the, the debugger. So there I'd need a Windows VM, at least for that capability. I still have a ISO from Word 2010. This seems to, to work pretty good for me. It avoids me having to register the project with Microsoft in order to activate it. And uh, it hasn't kicked me out. And as far as I can tell, I've seen no significant differences between... Um, you know, the more recent version of Office Suite, the, the installed version, and just running Office 2010. Uh, there's our enable content. So by default, I still have that as the, as the default, right? I don't want those macros to execute quite yet. And then if you go into your options here, you'll see you can customize 
the ribbon. And this is how I do it. I'm sure there's a quicker way, but I just check the box for developer. And then what that provides me is the developer tab, which allows us to open the visual basic project. Okay, now there's things that can happen here. You can have a protected project that locks you out of looking at the macro code, although you can still dump the macro code using tools like OLE dump. You know, there's there's a lot of things, but in this case, there's no protections. We have our macro streams, just like we were investigating. And then we also have the form. Now I don't typically need to, or care about the actual form here every once in a while, but you'll see as you highlight the different objects, that's P-I-N-E-A-L, that's the one object that we were looking at earlier. And if we look at the control tip text, right, there's, there's some content there. That's certainly the content that we were looking at. So that connects the two of those together a bit. Um, how to get Microsoft Word 2010? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm just a, I guess, an ISO hoarder. <laughs> so I've got a NAS that's full of old things that I've been collecting and saving for years. I don't remember even where I got my copy of 2010, but I, I think I purchased it through some employee program years ago. I, I know there are ISOs on archive.org. Um, I have had people point those out to me. I think you have to still get a key to authenticate. Um, in this version of 2010, it doesn't even prompt me for a key. Uh, I don't remember all of the variations of how the Office Suite was allowed you to install it back then. Uh, I've just been using this one for so long. So it, it's a bit challenging. You might be able to find some for sale on eBay or Amazon, although now you're purchasing software that's old from, I don't know, <laughs> people that you may not be able to trust. Uh, but it, it can be a little tricky. Um, yeah, Office 360. I mean, that's the one Microsoft wants everybody on. They, they don't necessarily care about the malware analysts when it comes to the Office suite. They care about the normal user. So uh, it, it, can be, it can be tricky to get the older versions. I mean, the newer version works fine. The only thing I don't like about it is that I have to sign in to activate it. Uh, so I just, I don't like associating my personal account or any, really any personal information about myself in any of the malware analysis tools that I use. So I do try to be very careful, operational security kind of considerations. Okay, so we don't, we don't need to worry about that user form, uh, but what we can do now, uh, I think this was right. There's our cabriolet. Now, now we can set a breakpoint. Now here, here's a tricky thing. And again, I know I've, I've had a workaround in the past. I just can't remember it. Uh, when you go ahead and execute, want to execute those macros and step through them with the debugger, then you have to first enable content, which runs the macro code. Then you can go in and set a debug breakpoint. I know there's a workaround for it, but for this particular sample, it really doesn't cause me any issues. So I might open up, in this case, Process Hacker. I'm anticipating a process to launch, explorer.exe, and actually it's SVC host or explorer.exe. So it's gonna pick a different base process depending on the architecture. But I just have to look for Word. So here's Process Hacker, it's open, it's showing me the processes running on the system. Under explorer.exe will be anything launched from my desktop session. I can just look for Word once it opens. Okay. Once that opens, we'll enable content, and there it is. So in this, in this instance, it tried to, it launched SVC host. I'm gonna terminate that. Now, a couple of things just about kind of environment setup. Um, first, I have my network adapter disabled and so that nothing can connect out from my VM. So just trying to, uh, to mitigate, it's an old dock. So the odds of it being able to actually connect to anything are just about minimal at this point, but there's no point in taking any chances because if I don't get into that habit, then the one time I forget, it'll use the network adapter, get, get, get loose on my network or download the next stage payload. And, and if I'm in a proper lab environment, it really should still be fairly minimal, but I think it's just a good practice. Um, the other thing is I took a snapshot before this. That way, as I'm getting deeper and deeper into my analysis, into my investigation, then I can, I can, you know, I can more quickly revert back to a snapshot than necessarily having to set everything up. So, so keep that in mind as we're going through here, right? 
open up the document, enable content, kill the process. We're going to go back into the macros. I'm going to go down to Cabriolet. Now we can just click in the margins, set a breakpoint, and we've got the ability to debug. So I'm going to go to View, Toolbars, Open Debug. I don't know why that doesn't open by default, but that's going to give me more granular control with debugging. Basic debugging, begin debugging, stop debugging, step into functions, step out of functions. Set a breakpoint anywhere on the left. You'll see wherever you can set a breakpoint, breakpoints will be set. Now we can begin our, our debug session. Uh, this is going to ask which macros to start in. We know manslaughter was called, so we'll hit run. And in this case, we it almost went immediately to our breakpoint. So we got the yellow the yellow highlighting indicating that we are at our breakpoint and we're ready. We're we're now in control of, of manual execution. So, um, you know, the trick with setting breakpoints is that you have to be fairly confident that. The, the execution flow of the program is going to hit that breakpoint. If we hit start and we never hit this breakpoint, then we'd have to back up and figure out why didn't the execution stop there. Um, if it takes off and ransoms our environment, well, then we're glad we created a snapshot because now we can revert back, set new breakpoints, do a little bit better analysis, and go from there. Um, now we can also, with debugging, not only now do we control the flow, but we can, we can investigate variables. So Aprum, our first variable, we can add a watch. And what that'll do is that'll show us our value down below. So that has a value of 41551104. That is base 10. Oops, there we go. And open up a calculator. Switch to programmer. I'm going to paste that in, make sure we're base 10, convert that to hex. And there's our hex value, 27A0500. And what we can do with that now is we can't, we can't continue the trace in the macros because this is now transferring execution to this, this shell code in memory. So we have process hacker, we have word, we double click on that or right click properties. Well, you can go to the memory tab. Okay, 27A0500. So we'll just scroll down uh, 27A. This one kind of stands out. You'll see its, its permissions are read, write, execute. Of course, we know that the CPU, the, this, the system's about to go there and execute code because that's the whole purpose of that enum dates format. So if it didn't have execute permissions, it would cause a crash. So these RWX permissions oftentimes stand out. And we can now look at the content of that memory because we see it all happening in real time. 27A0000, and then at an offset of 500 hex, this is where it's going to begin. That's where it's going to begin execution. So this first, this first byte or two. Um, is this valid code? Mm, I believe so. We can, oh, I don't have CyberChef on this, but uh, we could use something like CyberChef to disassemble it. We could, if we were really keen on investigating this, we could attach a debugger. We could um, extract this from memory and disassemble it. There's a lot of things we could do, but I might just debugger. I said I still use WinDebug, so here we go. Attach to a process. Um, word, okay, word, winword.exe. That's where this memory was allocated. And here the screen, I'm going to do a break on access, execute one byte, and 27A0500. Okay. So debuggers are their own thing. And then that's probably a topic for another session. Um, especially if you're not real familiar with debugging. Uh, we have assembly level and source level. We're at an assembly level because we don't have the source code. Uh, two main types of setting breakpoints. We can set a software breakpoint or we can set a hardware breakpoint. And so what I decided to do here is to set a hardware breakpoint. I probably could have set a software. But all I'm saying is uh, BA is the hardware breakpoint. I want to break when a 
when execution is attempted at this address on the first byte. So that's now set. Uh, BL lifts our breakpoint, and we can just type G for go. And now that kind of releases the, the hold on that process, and we can go back to our macro, and now we can allow execution to continue. So if I did everything right, hopefully our breakpoint hit in WinDebug. So we can step over and breakpoint zero hit. There we go. Um, let's just grab the disassembly. All right, and here it is. So those are the bytes, 48895C. Uh, where's my property? There it is, 48895C, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that just confirms that we are now actually in the shell code. So, so now we can not only can we investigate it if we wanted to continue, but we have the ability to step through it as well. Um, and again, shell code is analyzing shell code is it's got its own little nuances and niches that we could talk about. Okay, uh, question: No inet sim on Remnix. Um, I thought there was inet sim on Remnix, but I guess I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, they do in their documentation provide a list of all the tools that are installed. So I would start there if um, if if you're not sure. Uh, how do we manage persistence? Mm, I don't know. Is it, uh, what persistence are you talking about? Uh, generally speaking, when it comes to office documents, there is usually a whole lot of persistence. They're, they're kind of a one and done. The macros will run. Maybe they do PowerShell. Maybe they do VB script. Maybe they do something like this where they execute some shell code. But if, if they cannot retrieve the next stage, once the code executes, it's done. It's usually those later stages, the, the malware itself, the you know the the the, the Q bots and the emotets. That's where the persistence usually is then seen. So then, when you get into those persistent techniques, there's a variety of things that they can do in order to maintain that persistence. But oftentimes, if this document fails to retrieve the next stage, it's there's you know there was some success on the attacker's part for sure but it's not gonna restart itself unless the user opens it and enables content. It was about cleaning up our VM after analyzing. Um, yeah, so I, I guess uh, persistence just in terms of artifact collection and stuff, I'm still not sure I'm, I'm following you on the question, but uh, you know, anything that I, I think is valuable, um, I, I grab I grab everything before I reset the snapshot. So, for example, if yes, uh, David would like to the shell code. I'll, I'll I'll provide the shell code. So I'll put this all on my GitHub um, later today or tomorrow. But if this one, let's say we go to this memory allocation, we can now save it. Process Hacker is just one of many ways we could dump it with WinDebug. Uh, we can go to the desktop, and I'll just say, you know, in my mind, this is you know stage one shell code. Uh, and this looks to be 64 bit and, and why I say that somebody asked about zooming in the font. So let me see, this is probably where we're running into some font size issues. Let's go big. All right. So the reason I say, uh, 64 bit is because we can see, um, RBP, RSI, RDI. So the, these are your registers for those that may not be familiar with assembly mnemonics and syntax, these are our, our registers. So little chunks of memory down at the CPU. E, so EBP, ESI, EDI, that would indicate a 32-bit execution or a 32-bit program. R is just the 32-bit extended to 64-bit. So this would imply to me that this is, this is running in a 64-bit context. So now we have, through Process Hacker, you know, dump that memory, give it a name I can remember. And now we have that artifact. So if I wanted to copy that out of the VM for, for later analysis or to share with a colleague, I could definitely do that. And now I can revert the snapshot if I need to and be back to where I was just before we started with this demo. So this was, you know, this is a lot. Uh, there's a lot that goes into the, the you know, the, the macros and the office documents and the, the, the kind of the, the obfuscation that they have there. I found the easiest way is just to grab them and analyze them. You know, go to places like Triage and Anyrun, grab a document, analyze it, see what happens. 
Um, I know I put an hour on the, uh, I think for the schedule, but I've got a little bit more I want to cover. So I'm going to just keep going. It's a recording. It's a long one. I know, but, uh, I took the time to get all this demo ready. So I might as well use it. If, uh, if anyone needs to drop off, I understand. And I really appreciate you taking the time to join me today. Uh, but for those sticking around, we're going to look at one more document here. So I'm going to switch back to Remnix. And this is a much more recent document that was classified as dropping Emotet. And uh, of course, as I, I'm sure a lot of folks know, Emotet was gone for a little while. It looked like some law enforcement action took them out, but now they're back again. So um, emo.doc, that's the name that was given to it when it was uploaded to any run. We can just do a file on this one. You'll see uh, Microsoft Office Word. You'll notice that this one in the subject, in the metadata of the file, we have you know nonsensical stuff, handmade, Argentina, handcrafted, frozen towels, yellow. But then there are some words like virtual and array that they might actually have a significance in the the the, the you know the, the macros. Hello, Cerberus. <laughs> um, the and so you will find from time to time. Oops, sorry. You will find from time to time, this is another place that important content can get stashed. Um, and maybe it's the whole entire content. It could be the whole subject or it could just be bits and pieces. So we've got an office doc. Uh, let's look at the macro structure. Okay, we can see we've got user form and we have three streams, 11, 12, and 13. I think I already extracted those. So there's 11, 12, and 13. So I'm not going to worry about doing that again. Uh, uh, I'm going to open those in code. I'm going to close my other ones just so I don't get too confused here. OK. Um, Luck of the draw, stream 11 is our document open. There isn't nearly as much obfuscation here. So we can see that it is calling this method, x8tw, from this module. We could take a look at, this is a reason why on occasion, instead of just giving the, the name, the stream index, I might actually give it the name. But we can see that this stream name, get for IP, some extra characters, that's stream 12. So now we go to 12. Whoops. Make sure I copy and paste that. And there's our function. Now, this one, you'll, you'll notice, lazy power dev. Yeah. <laughs> yes, obfuscate, 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 grab a beer. Um, so this one you can see in the in the the mini the mini view the the thumbnail view you know it looks like it's following a pretty consistent pattern. So whatever obfuscator they're using, um, it, it looks pretty consistent. So likely there's a fair bit of this that is just junk. Um, a lot of it then is going to be deobfuscation of those strings in order to you know kind of unravel that next stage. We have user form objects, so we could look at those as well, but. We'll just take a look at this for a minute. Now, when it comes to these strings, something that Emotet has apparently done for a while is they like to put padding in their strings. They like to put little, little tokens and then replace those out or, or, or replace those with, with an empty string. Um, we could look for things like replace. I don't see it. We could look for things like create object or maybe just create. And that doesn't mean that it's not in another stream. And I know you are. There it is. And, and looking for those key functions might be another way to, to sort of expedite your analysis. Now, in this case, uh, it's create object and then it's this variable. And we'd have to trace this back in order to understand a little bit more about it. And I, you know, again, you may or may not want to do that. Oftentimes, I'm looking for the path of least resistance. So if we go back to our stream 12, 
you'll notice that with these strings, um, they don't immediately look like they make a whole lot of sense. I like to do just maybe a little bit of cleanup first. I'm going to take the double equal, a little too crowded, the, uh, the, the double quote plus double quote, replace that out, right? Because all that's doing is concatenating a string, so it, it serves no purpose. And then uh, you might just take and you see as we highlight each character, it highlights that pattern amongst that string and other other strings in this in this macro stream. So eventually we'll go too far, and you'll see we, now we lost that. So this tells me that right here is likely the pattern that is being replaced. So we can take that into find replace, real simple, replace it, and now a string is emerged. Colon win32 underscore win MGMT. So it looks like some basic evidence of WMI. Uh, that could then be a way to start tracing these variables and maybe you know get a little bit better understanding of what's going on here. Now, another thing that I've observed with these Emotet docs of past is that they're going to execute a base64 string. Uh, let's do this. Let's look at. I mean, practically speaking, I would. I would very rare would I. Oh, I already have it loaded. Um, would I just you know blindly look at a um, look at a, a document statically? You know, I'm, oftentimes I'm going and seeing if it's on a sandbox. If it's not, I'm uploading it because that can give me some insight into what's going on. So. Here we have WinWord launching PowerShell through WMI. Ah, something that we observed. PowerShell dash encode, that's a base64 string that PowerShell will automatically decode and execute. So that tells us that we're on the right track. If you look at this base64, you'll see that it's quite large. Certainly, we're not seeing any evidence of that and I toggle word wrap because sometimes the strings are just far off the screen. So toggling the word wrap will get them to go multi-line. And then you'll see this big string show up in your mini bar, or mini, the mini view. Um, nothing here. So that says to me, well, it's probably in those, in those forms. So we might be able to just dump strings. Uh -huh. On our document. And sure enough. We have something that looks very much like a big blob of code, and you can recognize our repeating pattern. So this would be a good time, I guess, to kind of drop that into a text file, open that up in Visual Studio. There's two strings in here. I don't want that string. So I'm just going to go in there, manually remove it. And, oops, do very similar because I forgot the pattern already, but there it is. And replace all 6,268 references. Okay, so now I'm feeling good. I think we got an easy win. And this looks like a base64 because it is the argument to our PowerShell command. It's, it's almost identical, if not identical, to what we just saw when we looked at this in, 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 in any.run. All right, so let's highlight that. And one thing, I just saw the comment about Visual Studio Code. One thing I like about Visual Studio Code um, is that it's got syntax highlighting for Visual Basic. So down in the corner here, you can see it detected that we're looking at VB and then it does all the syntax highlighting for me. So I like that. I'm sure other editors have that as well, but um, I, I know it's there with Visual Studio. Okay, so CyberChef, I don't suppose a, any malware analysis session would be complete without using CyberChef at least once. If you're using Remnix, it is, there is a standalone version installed in Remnix. So just searching for CyberChef will launch that in the browser like you see here. 
There is an online version as well. So you can just type in CyberChef online and you can get an online instance to do all of your cyber chefing. And I'll paste that in. Let me delete this. And now we just need to look for our operation. So in the, in the off chance you haven't used it before uh, from base 64. So all we're doing is we're looking for these operations, drag and drop them into this recipe. And then it'll take this input, run it through this operation. And then that output will either be displayed here or you can chain together multiple operations to come up with a more complete recipe. Notepad++, yeah, yeah, it does. Does it choke on large data files? I have. I don't use Notepad++. I used to use it a lot. I was. It was my go-to. I don't know when I switched to Visual Studio Code, uh, but somewhere along the way I, I did, and I just that's just become my go-to. I don't have any real strong feelings either way, um, as long as it gets the job done. But back to this, you'll notice, shoot, right? We don't have anything that looks intelligible. Now, Base64 can oftentimes be part of a, a, a number of iterations of compressing and obfuscation. However, this is supposedly used with PowerShell, which means that if this Base64 is executing by PowerShell, it has to be something that PowerShell can decode and execute, otherwise it doesn't serve a purpose. So what could be different? And pondering that for a few minutes, it became apparent to me. Let's look at the first three bytes here. Uh, I, A, B for this PowerShell, the, the, the PowerShell, the base 64 portion of this command. When we go back to, oh, where'd my CyberChef go? CyberChef. You'll see I, P, A, A, B, Y, T, K, A, Y. It doesn't actually match up. It's different. And so that's okay. I, that's an obfuscation technique. Again, it's, it's very trivial, but it's very effective because now not only can we not just simply identify the pattern, replace it in base 64 to code for the next stage, there's something else that's being done. And because this content can be manipulated until it's ready for execution in the macro code, the malware authors can certainly focus on just the base 64 portion of this and further manipulate it. Um, question about unsigned executables. Uh, it prompts you with warnings. Does the same thing happen in malicious docx? Um, you know, typically what you'll get with a malicious document is the, the enable content. Um, I don't know if there's any different mitigations in windows as of right now. Um, but what I typically see is you get the enable content if macros are disabled by default, and that's really the only warning the user gets. Otherwise, um, the macros begin to execute. I know there's a way in an organization to say only execute signed macros, and then you can manage a process of signing macros. I don't know how prolific that is for organizations and, and blue teams to implement. Certainly it's more overhead in developing and releasing those macro docs, but I don't think you get a whole lot of, of prompting at that point. Um, so when looking at this then, uh, what, what I observed just by visually inspecting the patterns, is that, uh, where did I have that? So let's go back to, right? This is kind of like the truth data, right? This, this executed, we know this executed because if you look at things like the DNS request, we can see that there was some follow-on activity that most likely came from this PowerShell script. Um, IAB are the first three characters. And if we go, and I'm all over the place on that. Uh, if we go back to our code here, See if I can zoom it in a little better. I P A A B. If we just skip, I A B. Sorry, I forgot that already. If we just skip every second character, I A B, then we get our string. So, CyberChef, of course, has a replace function. And okay, good. <laughs> I was wondering if I remembered the regular expression I came up with. Um, so regular expression to say, look for every second character and replace it. Um, get rid of it. Now we have the output. 
and you can see that this output actually makes sense. Now you'll notice there's all these little dots here. That's because when you encode your PowerShell command for the, the dash encode, it's, it's UTF-16, which means it's, it's multi-byte characters. With ASCII characters, it's one byte per character. This is two bytes per character, which is why we have that dot. We can decode this text. So we'll, we'll make that the last operation. And then we have to pick UTF-16LE. Now we have our next stage. So we can grab this, copy it to the clipboard, and I'm just gonna open up a new tab here and we'll do a word wrap. This looks like a jumbled mess. Of course, it just has to be syntactically valid. It doesn't have to be anything that any human being can read, but it does have to be syntactically valid. So one of the first things I typically do is just to throw in some new lines. So PowerShell has a semicolon to terminate a line or a statement, so we can just add that in. And that at least helps me to visually parse out that, hey, these look like URLs. So now we have this chunk of text here. Now this is, this is again, sort of a common, what's going on, pattern that I've, I've seen with Emotet over the last couple of years in that the next stage, they typically have this, this array of four or five different URLs that they then iterate through to try to download the file, drop it to the file system and execute it. So what we can do with this, let's just open up another tab. I'm gonna paste in just what I suspect is the URLs. Um, give me a second here. I cheated and I went through this beforehand because I knew as soon as I got live and started talking, I'd forget. Um, and so what I wanna do is just try to figure out how to get just the URLs here. And again, one of the first things I, I generally look at trying to clean up, if I put this leading single quote, is the, the, all the concatenation. And, and you'll notice that the, the concatenation here will be a single quote and a single quote and then there'll be a plus sign, and then there may be an open or close paren, maybe multiple. So I wrote some regular expression that should work, although it's complaining about that now. Hmm. Okay, I'll this like there we go my plus sign somehow disappeared and that looks like it got most of them so that'll at least clear up uh clear up that that particular concatenation problem and then the last little bit here is just that pattern and, and you can actually observe that pattern if you go back to this code you'll see so here's that original deobfuscated powershell you'll see there's a replace and then here's our replace function What's it replacing with? Well, let me get rid of that. So it's doing a replace, it's looking for that pattern, and it's actually replacing with a forward slash. So knowing that, we can come back to this working, working copy. This is not a regular expression, that is just a pattern. And now replace that with a forward slash. And it looks like we've got pretty clean URLs here, all separate, separated by an ampersand. So, okay, one last thing. We'll replace the ampersand with a null. And that's that. And there we go. One, two, three, four, five, six. There are seven, potentially seven domains that it was attempting to drop Emotet from. And, you know, had we just stuck in the, in the sandbox, Zoom that in. You'll see it, it, there's quite a few of them here because it looks like it was having trouble with DNS. It couldn't resolve an IP address. So that, in a way that forced it to iterate through all of those domains. But had it connected on the first one, downloaded the next stage, it wouldn't have gone through the remaining, how many did we say? The remaining five, one, two, three, four, five, six. And so this can be valuable information. 
If you go to sandboxes like triage, they have you know con- what they call config extractors. Normally, those are, I think, more associated, at least in my mind, with the actual executables. But certainly, when you get an office doc, knowing that there are potentially more than one URLs to extract, you can write some code to go ahead and extract that content. Um, for a while there, maybe a year or two ago, Drydex and the exercise that I have, uh, they were doing 50, 60, 100 different domains inside of their documents. So if you could automate the extraction of that, you could expose a lot of their infrastructure. So it was kind of neat. It was kind of fun, kind of a head scratcher. <laughs> Why would you put so many in there? This seems a little bit more manageable. And uh, this definitely is something that, that again, that Emotet's been doing. So, you know, the first example, we, we try to dig a little bit deeper into the code, a little more complicated because it was using shell code and some pro and then the shell code was what would do the process hollowing. Um, here, let's skip over getting lost in the macros and let's just try to extract the important bits of this content, which we were able to do. Um, now, I had one last document in mind, but I'm way over time. Uh, and that's an Excel 4 document. So maybe we'll do another session and I'll, I'll more appropriately scale my, my samples uh, so that I don't talk for so long. But we'll take a look at Excel 4 here in the next one. And it's, you know, it, it, they are, are there's going to be a lot of similarities. There certainly are some differences though. Now I mentioned the exercise. So that's, since I'm sharing the screen. Oh no, let's do this. Um, at the very top of this GitHub. There it is. There is a, um, an automating download URL extraction with Python. So that was the, that was the exercise that I was referring to. This one has like the other exercises there. It has some, some challenge questions. So if you want to take the document, try to do the analysis without getting an answer, that's what that's designed for. I know that those can be, you can get stuck. I know I oftentimes really early on when I was looking for examples to follow along with, and I think that's a great a great place to start. Find a write-up, find something that you can follow along and just do it, do it step by step. You can still get stuck. So here's a whole solution walkthrough and takes you through the analysis of the document and then an analysis of some Python that I wrote in order to, as you'll see here, to basically do what we did, except automate the extraction of those of those domains that we're, we're downloading. Um, I can't say that the Python is the best ever. I just threw something together so that it would work. I don't oftentimes spend a lot of time on this because either I don't use it that regularly or because it changes so often. So feel free to criticize my Python, but it's not, I'm sure there's tons of room for improvement there. So you can check that out if you'd like. Some of the other exercises here, these are also on Cyber Defenders. Um, so if you haven't been to Cyber Defenders, I had a tab open. I don't know what I did with it, but um, Cyber Defenders, it's, it's, they've got a, a lot of different training options. One of them, though, is a free CTF platform. So you can go there and you can start tackling these CTF challenges. Uh, again, kind of a spoiler alert, um, two, two or three of these are on Cyber Defenders. Um, so if you'd rather try to tackle these in a, in a CTF environment, this is a way to do that, but here's still a full solution because my goal with this was, was the education and the knowledge sharing, not necessarily a CTF for the sake of, of prize or points or something. Um, and then of course, I post been posting pretty regularly on YouTube. I will be, I already have the next live session scheduled. Thursdays at one seem like a good enough time. So next Thursday, one o'clock, we'll be talking a little bit of PE studio. Since I didn't get through the Excel documents, I'm going to schedule another session for that. So probably two weeks from now, we'll do another Thursday session and, um, and come back and, and tackle those. So appreciate any comments, uh, any subscribes, anything that you want, um, anything that I can do to help. Uh, I've got a long list of topics that I want to create longer than I probably have time to actually create them in. But if there's anything that, you know, it seems like a lot of folks are really interested in, I'd, I'd love to use that as a way to prioritize. So that's all I have for today. I do really appreciate everyone taking time to come and join. Uh, again, if you're catching this on a restream or, or the recording, you know, please, you can still, I'm still watching comments. So please feel free to engage there. If there's anything that I can answer, 
be happy to stick around for a little bit longer and do that. Otherwise, uh, I know I've went way over time, so I'll, I'll wrap things up and let everyone get on with their days for sure. Yes, thank you all. Thank you for the the feedback. Yeah, we could, we could talk about these all day. I mean, there's just so many variations and nuances. Um, I, hopefully, these are just some of the more common patterns, some of the more common tools and techniques that I use. So hopefully, everybody finds that helpful, especially for those that are you know really just getting started. Thanks for coming, Jerry. David. Proxy Life, I don't know your name, but I follow you on Twitter. Cerberus, uh, love following your work as well. Um, question, did I learn most of my stuff uh, at the university or outside of the university? Um, I would say, so it, it, it's kind of a weird situation for me. Um, I learned most of it outside of the university, but I found myself teaching it at the university, so I had to learn it. So it was really motivating for me because I was teaching classes at the university. I started with an undergraduate malware analysis course. And even before that, I actually started teaching um, a CSC 150-250, so uh, an intro to C programming, and then an assembly. Uh, I, don't, I didn't do a lot of assembly before then. So getting an opportunity to put together curriculum to teach it was really good, although a little frustrating at the time. Then I moved into an undergrad malware analysis and then graduate level and doctoral level. Um, a lot of it I learned then just on my own in order to teach. Uh, a good chunk of it I started to pick up when I got some opportunities to work in industry. I uh, started with Bromium a few years ago. That became HP. I've had some opportunities to work with, with some other orgs uh, doing you know pen tests and incident response and stuff. It's never been my primary bread and butter, but uh, or I mean my primary job, but I've, I do spend a lot of time doing it. So I would say the university gave me the opportunity, and then I, I sought outside opportunities to, to learn, get those skills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's great. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's an opportunity. I think it's I don't know. Again, it's it's just been it's just been weird. I've just found myself in a, in a really unique situation um, with the the teaching side of things, and because there's so much overlap, stuff I do at say Bromium becomes really good material for a training or for a class. It just it just overlaps so well. But without some a foot in the door with industry, I I, I think it would have been really challenging for me personally to, to make that transition. Yeah. Yeah. I would say probably the university was the, the foundation of it. I just, I had to develop the skills on my own. I didn't have a resource per se there. Have I always been a white hat? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have. Uh, somebody asked me the other day if I I got an email every once in a while if I sell panels and stuff and I'm like, nope, <laughs> I don't do anything uh, criminal, at least not to my knowledge. Yeah, uh, so just a question uh, or more of a comment about uh, being a SOC analyst. Um, I do have, if you go to my YouTube, I do have a, a playlist on there that has um, some workshops I've done in the past. One of them in particular was a, was a four-hour session at Hack in the Box in Dubai a couple of years ago. It was virtual. Uh, four hours, I know that's a lot, but it's it's this, but over four hours. So it might be a good opportunity if, if there's still some concepts that you're, you know, feel aren't, aren't quite clicking to go and, and go through that. It's on YouTube, so it's free. Um, and and, and the, all the materials are here. Pretty sure I posted them on this GitHub um, I think, yeah, it's right here. It's this one or this one. There's, there's maybe two of them. So that might be a, a more, uh, you know, cause that was a four hour session. So I, I took a little bit more time, slow down a little bit. Oh yeah. Thank you for, uh, for using my material. I, I love creating content and, and sharing it. Uh, Jerry said that getting into live streaming would be a lot of fun. Um, and it really is. There's an engagement that I've, I miss, certainly in the last couple of years, not being able to do a lot of live in-person trainings as those are starting to come back. There's that in-person, there's that live interaction that I, I certainly miss. I do a lot of, I don't know, recorded content, which is just me talking to this computer. But uh, this has been a lot of fun and what's certainly time permitting, like to continue doing it. 
Um, how is work in NCA in term of knowledge? Uh, what is, I'm not familiar with NCA or if I am, it's just eluding me right now. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, Christian, if you if you follow up on that, I'll, I'll be happy to try to answer. Uh, but again, thank you everyone for joining, um, and and thank you for all the feedback and comments. Uh, hope next Thursday, one o'clock, we'll we'll do it again. We'll talk PE Studio and binary files, and and just shift gears a little bit, and then maybe the week after that, we'll come back to Excel Docs and just do this until we run out of ideas or, or energy. Oh, how is work NSA? Um, I've not worked for the NSA. Um, I've been fortunate to get a couple of grants through the university, but it's all been content development and, um, I am doing a little bit of research right now. Uh, I've got a tool that I've been working on with a really talented, uh, undergraduate student. And our plan is to submit that to black hat arsenal and, and hopefully get an opportunity to present that in a formal fashion. Worst case scenario. We're going to launch it sometime on GitHub here this summer. Uh, the idea behind it is it's like a, uh, if you're familiar with Moloch or, or Archimy, um, it's like that, but for files. So parsing PE files, parsing ELF files, parsing um, uh, OLE files, office documents, and then being able to get all that data into an elastic instance, add in dynamic analysis and all of it. And just we, what we hope is a very easy and, and intuitive to use interface that's where I reference Archimy. I think Archimy has just got such a, an easy and intuitive interface to filter through large data sets. So that's what we tried to recreate, just not with network traffic, with our files. So um, that is a project that the NSA has helped fund me to do some, do some development on. All right, I'm gonna stop my screen share. All right. Well, I think it's time. Uh, so thank you again. All I'm going to end the session and hopefully see you all next week.